week, what we saw was part of the suffering of Jesus. He's rejected, rejected by his own family, rejected by the religious establishment. Now, I want you to think for a moment, if you were one of his disciples, what would you think if you were with Jesus and you experienced that? I mean, you're standing around, Jesus' family comes up and says, he's out of his mind. <laughs> what would you do? You'd probably start thinking, I think this group is not just going to work out. And I assure you, there were a lot of people back then, when they looked at the, the disciples of the early church, they were thinking to themselves, this just is not going to work. But surprise, 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 it did work out. And it tells us something about how God works in his kingdom. Let's see what Jesus has to say to us this morning. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Many such parables he spoke the word to them, and as they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. Let's pray and ask God to bless this reading of his word. Our Heavenly Father, help us to be like the disciples who are willing to listen to your word. To understand and to see what the mystery of the kingdom of God is all about. And help us today to realize that your way of doing things is not like our way. Hear our prayer now. Amen. I have mixed feelings about mysteries. And there's a sense where I like a good mystery. I mean, after all, the days go on, same old, same old, and so what you would like is a little mystery to add spice to your life, so what we do, we get out our mystery novels, the whodunits, so that in the end we can be surprised, or you may turn to one of your criminal TV shows where there is a murder mystery, and you will binge watch. And as you are watching it, you are thinking to yourself, who actually did it? Remember back in the days when there was nothing but radio, the radio shows where they told the stories of the murder mysteries and everything. We need that type of excitement in our lives. But there is another sense where I'm not thrilled about mysteries at all in life. I mean, can you imagine if you did not know what was going to happen the moment you stepped out the door? Let's just say gravity didn't work anymore. Life would be turned upside down. And there's a lot of things that I would consider mysteries that I do not fully understand. You want to accomplish something, but you don't know how it's done. Isn't that frustrating when you have a job and you really have not been trained to do it? look at the task, but it's a mystery of how it should be done. You may have felt that way in school when the teacher gave you an algebra problem or a calculus problem. You didn't know what to do with it. It was all a big mystery to you. And when it comes to the kingdom of God, it can be the same thing. You ask yourself, what in the world is God doing? What is he doing with us? What is he doing in the United States of America? What is he doing across the world? 
and we have to confess at times it's a mystery we don't know, or to even be more personal, you want to make the right choice. But you don't know what you should do. Should I choose option A? Should I choose option B? It doesn't say in the Bible which one I should choose, but you want to do what is right and pleasing to God. It's a mystery. God has a way of defying our desire for explanations. And don't get me wrong. There are some things that are crystal clear in the Bible. It is crystal clear that Jesus Christ died for our sins. It's crystal clear that they confessed in the confession. He's going to come again. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. There's going to be a new heaven to the new earth. Those things are certain. But there are other things I just don't know about. What's going on in history? What's going on in the church? Don't know. Don't know. I just don't know. And the Holy Spirit has given us these words today. To help us to realize that when you think of the kingdom of God, there's an awful lot of mystery that we just don't understand. It's confusing to us. So let's look at some of those areas where Jesus says there's going to be some mystery. And here's one of the mysteries. You do not know how the kingdom of God grows. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if we did know how it grows? Why, you could go out and you could publish a book, and everyone would want to read it, because you know how the kingdom of God grows. And it would be, if you do this, this will happen. It would always work. Now, social science, and even hard science, you realize most of the time the experiments don't work. They don't work. They don't know because they don't know what is actually going on. Or let's just say someone came up with the perfect book of prayer where if you pray this way, you would see these results all the time. Do you see what we want? Certainly. And some of you have probably gone out and bought self-help books of all sorts to help you get the results you want because you want guarantees. But then you read a passage like this, and what does Jesus say? There's mystery. Look at what he said. He has just dealt with his family, who in some sense has rejected him. The religious leaders in Jerusalem think he's of the devil. And then he turns and he starts to teach people. And he uses parables. You know what a parable is? It's a, the earthly story with the heavenly meaning. It is a way that Jesus can make the truths of the gospel concrete. Uh, it would be similar to the sermon illustration. And he uses an agricultural imagery here. He does often, in which the people would have understood this. They were part of an agricultural economy. He talks about a farmer, and he's going out to scatter seed. Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a farmer, and he's going out, and he's scattering seeds. But here's where the problem comes in. He sleeps and rises day and night. And the seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't know how. He doesn't know how. He's ignorant of it. But the earth just produces. And it goes from a seed to a blade, to a tear, to a full grain, and then there's going to be a heart. And Jesus is saying to his disciples and to his followers, look, kingdom of God's going to grow. But how that actually works out in time and space is a mystery, and don't think you can understand it. Remember back when we were going through Ecclesiastes, what it says? 
Remember what the book of wisdom says that we were reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5? As you not not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with a child, so you do not know the work of God who makes up everything. In the morning you sow your seeds, and evening withhold not your hands, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike are good. You simply do not know. So you know what this means for all of us who like certainty and simplicity? Get over it. It just is not going to work that way. And there's a lot of Christian life. You and I are not going to understand. We can't explain it. What we have got to get over is asking for quick, easy formulas for how the kingdom grows. But you know, go out to the Christian bookstores. That's what you will find. And it may work in church A, but it may not work in church B. But yet, what do we want? Well, if we just had the right program, the right ideas. But Jesus is saying, look, this is the mystery. You don't know why. And I know in my own life, when I have presented the gospel, sometimes I go off pretty slick. And you know what happens? Nothing. There have been other times where I have mumbled through it. Uh, 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 Jesus saves. Believe. Somebody believes. Why? It doesn't seem it goes against the, the formulistic idea that we want things to happen a certain way. It doesn't work that way. It just asks, leads to, to more questions in our minds and even in your individual souls. How does it work out? We are. It does. But why do some people respond and others do not? Why do some people seem to grow so much in grace and others may not? Or why do others seem to have no spiritual life until the final years of their life? Why is it that way? I do not know. And when you think of the church of God and what is happening here, here in America or in Warrington and Pensacola, there's an awful lot that we simply do not understand what God is up to. But we do have confidence He is at work. We just don't know all the details. We don't know how it goes. And here's something else we have a hard time with. We don't understand the potency of we don't understand how powerful it is. And once again, I want you to think about what those first disciples were like and what people thought of the early church. Now let's go over the facts. Jesus claimed to be a Messiah, but he died. And he didn't rise again. We have a group of disciples. They're not the green team. They've got some problems. I would not have chosen that group. And then there's no real infrastructure. That's a big term we throw around today. The advertisement wasn't that great by the standards of that time. It wasn't a great marketing ploy to get people to come to church. And that's what we want, isn't it? We think of the big corporations of the world like Amazon, Google, they do all of those things. But the early church didn't have that. It did not look good. And when people looked at the church, they said, man, this is a ragtag, powerless group. And you know what Jesus says? You, you guys don't understand the power of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is like what? Like what type of seed congregation? Mustard. Now, I'm glad you said that because you know what I've got here? Mustard seed. You want to know how tiny mustard seed is? Well, we're going to pass some out. Here you go. Here, have some mustard seed. I want everybody to have some mustard seed this morning just to see what mustard seed is like. Now, Jesus says 
that it was the smallest field, the uh, smallest seed of the field of mine, and that is true. And here you go. Now, I want you to look at this. And this is what he's saying the kingdom of God is like. Here you go. Have some mushroom tea. I got this at Walmart, by the way. So you can either plant it or put it on your cereal. There you go. Mushroom tea for everybody. There you go. There you go. Have a little more. There you go. Here, have some mushroom tea. Pass it down. Do good family stuff. Little kids get mustard tea. There you go. Pass it on. Is there a hint about that? Pass it on. There you go. Mustard tea. Here you go. Have some mustard tea. Mustard tea, mustard tea, mustard tea. Now, this is what Jesus is saying. The kingdom of God is. Mustard seed. Now look at that mustard seed. You're saying to yourself, huh? You're saying the kingdom of God is like this? What size is it? Tiny. Tiny. Small. But do you know what this mustard seed can turn into? One big, huge plant. So big in the Old Testament world, it would get big enough for the birds to build their nests. So big, Jesus says, this. It puts out large branches so the birds of air can make nests in its shade. It grows. And this is what's so amazing. When you think about this tiny little seed, what is in this tiny little seed can become huge. That's how the kingdom of God works. It can grow and grow and grow. And this is very important. Let me tell you why it's important. Because what are we impressed by? What's big? Size. The bigger, the better. The bigger the church, the better. We want to have the biggest and the best. And in nations of the world, what did you have to have? The biggest armies. There was the battleship race between World War I and World War II, where you had to have the biggest battleships. And Japan had the largest battleships. Guess what? They hardly ever fired a shot before they were sunk because they were obsolete. They were big. They were powerful, but they were worthless. But the gospel doesn't work that way. The gospel works with what is small and tiny and insignificant. This is why in the Bible you find God using staffs of wood, a jawbone of a donkey, a small wee cloud and people like Peter, Paul, people who are seemingly insignificant like a mustard seed. Yet that tiny little seed that seems so impotent is very potent and it becomes huge. And what happened in the gospel is it did spread throughout the world. And now it's in every part of the world. And it continues to grow. So let's look at how God works. Whether it is the insignificance of the 12 tribes of Israel, whether it is through a dead Messiah who rose again, or even through a wee little man like Zacchaeus, God and what we have to understand is that even though you seem weak and small, you don't exactly know what God is doing. You can't figure it out. And here's what I hear all the time. It's, it's about parts of the kingdom activity, like prayer, for instance. Here's what I heard from someone I know. I don't need prayer, it's just words. 
Just words. Just words. Words that go to the all-powerful God of the universe. No, it's not just words. It's part of the way God operates. He wants to turn things on its head so that we see that he really is the one in control. That is the God we worship. The God who takes what is small and so insignificant like see, and develops a kingdom that's going to last forever. That's our God. So don't ever look down on small people. Small congregations, or even the insignificance of the way God seems to work. Because one day at the end of time, he's going to surprise. Kingdom? It is a mystery. And that mystery should be expected by us. Because it's the way it works. He's not like you. He's not like me. God is in the business of turning our thoughts upside down. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would impress upon us your might and power and the mystery of your kingdom. Oh, Lord Jesus, we don't know how you work, but we do know that you have a tendency to use the powerless people in this world. Those who are lowly for your kingdom. Help us, our God, to see that and keep us from the idolatry of this present age, which everything is bigger has got to be better. Because one day you're going to surprise us when you come again. So hear our prayer. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 231.